I now call this meeting of the Amateur Detective Club to order. I'm Tyler Riley, cop and a half. I'm Melissa Maley, the spy. And I'm Tristan Miller, the saucy sleuth. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash adcpod and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash adcpod. Cool. What are we talking about today? We are talking about Agatha Christie's Poirot, Series 3, Episode 8. The Spanish... I was guess like 6. The Spanish Chest? I, yeah, the... Yeah. yeah. The, the mystery of the Spanish Chest? <laughs> the, There's a question mark after it, which is why we're saying it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the title. <laughs> Um, fun fact, this mm. is, again, another short story. Yes, I think I remember it. it. Was, uh, yeah, it was published um, in magazines first, and then she compiled it. And then they took, because the, the, the one that was in the magazines was slightly different than the one that's in the book. Mm. And I think this one is based off of the ones that came out of the magazine rather than the book. Oh, okay. Yeah, fun fact. Neat. Yeah. So we start off... And we're having this very dramatic, sepia-toned right. uh, fencing duel in what looks like the gymnasium at a church. It does. Right? It absolutely does. <laughs> yeah. We all had expensive churches. We did not have a gymnasium in my church. Oh, I mean, yeah. Neither did I in mine, but I knew of churches that had them. And yeah. this was it. <laughs> yeah. I did. I, I had been, at one point, I was, like, hanging out with friends, and there was a a church that had, like, a, um, a skate park in it. It was insane. It was, like, they had skate ramps in their gymnasium. My and I'm goodness. like, that's cool, dog, but, like, what? You're, you're, people aren't tithing at that point. Something's going on. You uh, got an ollie had... on the devil's head sometimes. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you got a McTwist for Christ. And ollie that's is a right. thing, right? McTwist for Christ. Yes, ollie <laughs> is a thing. Yeah, that's the, the basic. It's like the one thing I know how to say correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, we... got a, you got a 360 nose bone for the Lord. You got to just do it, <laughs> kids. We had a basketball, a couple of basketball hoops in our mm-hmm. in the gymnasium at our church and they were like mm-hmm. not at the opposite ends of the gym they were both in a corner and okay. so they we always had like coffee and cookies and stuff afterwards and everyone socialized and whatnot mm-hmm. yeah. and uh we uh we played around i like i remember like playing around and dancing on the uh the basketball hoops like mm-hmm. the back of them but never mm. using them for basketball <laughs> you had a dunk dunk for jesus or you misuse basketball hoops for jesus yeah. i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so they're in this fencing match and it's very dramatic it feels like a d- dream sequence or something there's a lot of slow-mo yeah i it's thought it very was very strange i was like did i click on the right show what is happening <laughs> I it's thought it was odd. a movie that they were watching or something. Yeah, I thought it was like one of those situations as well. But it turns out, I no. thought it was a memory, like off the mm. bat. Yeah, a dream within a dream. Th- yeah, that tracks. Um, but so then, when they were at the opera watching Rigoletto, I was a little confused because I yeah. expected them to be watching something, but it was not the same thing that I thought. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah. yeah. Um, they are at the opera watching Rigoletto and... Oh, uh, uh, can, I, can mm-hmm. I touch on the fencing again just real quick? Oh, please. Yes. Sure. Um, so it's these two people, like the scene is set up that like we mm-hmm. see like the chalk outline of, uh, I guess, the playing area for fencing. I'm not sure the proper terminology uh, um, for the that. The poking region? Yes, that's the right one. Yeah. Awesome. Poking region. Hooking region? 
P- poking. poking region. Poking region. Okay. Yes. Poking region is the stab zone. <laughs> <laughs> Get into the Guardia zone. Stab zone. Airport. Is that anything? No. Um. But so they're set up. It's two gentlemen. It seems like one is very hesitant about this. He's just like, <laughs> "Come on! <laughs> like, are we really doing this? It was a joke, man. It was a joke." <laughs> Right, and the other guy is completely stoic and silent time. the entire uh, the entire scene, uh, and cuts the guys, cuts the guy who's speaking, cuts his wrist to like let him know, like, yes, this is serious, this is about to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the guy, the referee, speaking German for some reason, it's very strange. Who can say? That's why? all I have to say about that. We never get around to it. So they're about to fight, and uh, homeboy is like. But my God, we're English. Yeah. <laughs> and up until that point, I was just like, uh, like, don't be such like a wuss. Just get in there. Do it. Like, why are you trying to back out of it? But when he said, but my God, we're English. I was like, homeboy does have a point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's also. Other very- countries are looking at us right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is. You so can't. improper and very way more dramatic than anything yeah, that we do. You really going to embarrass us in front of the French the like Earth. that? Nah. And pre- then pretend to be more civilized, to be bringing civilization to, for example, India, and then stab each other. You can't do it. It's just not done. Can't do it. You can't do it. Not it's very, go very close up. The whole thing, and yeah, extreme. Like, what are they even doing? It looks like they're just swinging the swords around and clinking them in the air willy-nilly. I'm sure that was to cover up the fact that the, they didn't know what they were doing. Probably. And Which is, may I say, evident later on. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. And yeah. Uh, they, yeah, the guy who was saying, like, hey, what are we really doing, ends up cutting the other guy's cheek yeah, pretty badly. Yeah. Yeah, like really slicing it up. And then opera. Yeah. And Poirot and Hastings are looking very dapper in their tuxedos. Yes? Um, yes. I would same say question so. as last time. Are they any good? What? Melissa? Or are the opera singers any good? <laughs> yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, okay. I like them this time. Yeah. yeah. I like them as well. I just wanted to get a. A scholarly opinion about it. Yeah. Uh, so, the there's a woman with her opera glasses who spies Poirot and Hastings, and then at intermission... Using her opera glasses. Yeah. yeah. Um, then at intermission, she goes and finds them, and says, Hey, Poirot, remember me? You thought I was a suspect for this jewel robbery. And... Poirot says, ah, yes, of course, I remember you, and you. it is so lovely to see you. And she says, gosh, you're just the best detective in the entire world. And he says, I am. Or something <laughs> to that effect. He goes, he, yes. he did just say yes. <laughs> he and, says, you were brilliant. And he goes, I was. <laughs> and it's, Hastings looked, looks horrified. Uh, got a whiter shade of white. Yeah. Uh, if possible. But the lady points out a very pretty woman, young woman, at the opera and says, hey, you see her over there? Uh, I'm very worried that her husband is trying to kill her. And there, and Poirot says, is that gentleman her husband? She says, oh, no, 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 he's just a friend. That's Major Rich. It's like, okie doke. Yeah. Uh, I will come visit you tomorrow at 11 and we'll chat about it. Can I tell you, Major Rich is the most chaotic looking person we've seen. Like, none of his face makes sense. And he's got that mustache and that terrible haircut that is not doing him any favors. I didn't think it was terrible. It just seemed to me like it was not good. Uh, But I. It also. (laughs) It looks unmanageable. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. I don't think it was a bad haircut. I think his hair, for him, just the texture by looking at it, yeah. seems like he just doesn't know what to do with it. 
It seems like it was like a recessive <laughs> yeah. gene in his family, and he is the one that like ha- now has to navigate this. Yeah, sure, sure. Like he has really curly hair, like he's Welsh or something, and he... but he's oddly attractive though. Oh, too many bones. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of with Melissa on this. Like he wouldn't be a first choice, but not a bad I mean, looking gentleman. No, he's got something about him too. There's like yeah. a little. I don't know. He just maybe, seems a little. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is the chaotic. Oh yeah, the major. Mm. This dude, we got different tastes. That's always fine. That's always apparent in these episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Lady's pretty cute, like a dollar value yeah. princess die. Yeah, we get some Ooh. dollar value people up and through this yeah. episode. Yeah. Because <laughs> Clayton, who I believe we see next, um, yeah. looks like a shaven, young-ish Kevin Klein to me. Yeah. Okay. If he, if he had fewer bones, yes. I don't know. Fewer I think the structural. Bones. Go back and look at the structural integrity of this man's face. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. He's the ba- basic like features, but like Kevin Klein got cheekbones, big mm. chin. Okay. Whereas okay. this guy, mm, fewer cheekbones. Fewer, yeah, not, okay. no cheekbones. Not, cheekbones not as pronounced. Yeah, if you took like Ian McDiarmid and Kevin Klein and fused them together, I don't know who that first person style. is. Um, he was Emperor Palpatine in the Star Wars, and he's also in Macbeth with Judy Dench and Ian McKellen. Uh, Palpatine, like the old guy? Yeah. 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 Oh, well, i never seen him without the makeup. Hopefully that's makeup. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is for <laughs> uh, most of it. Yeah, you got him in a prequel normal for a little while, right? Yeah, yeah. In the prequels, he looks just like Ian McDermott looks for most of it. Anyhow, uh, what happens next? Oh, the, um... He- <clears throat> Mr. Clayton goes by a shop and he's like, oh, I wonder if you can help me. There's something I'm looking for, but I don't know how to describe. Oh, it's when he's buying the chest. Oh, right. Uh, And then we see like uh, Mrs. Clayton at her home. Mm hmm. And is. Yeah, she comes home. And this is when Mr. Clayton r- arrives home and tells her that he's going away on business to Scotland. Yes. Before this, Clayton and another man, another mustachioed man, have a conversation. So many mustaches. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the conversation I was just talking about, about the box. He's looking for something. That's not a shop. They're at a... Um, Hall. At the, uh, the gentleman's club. Oh. And he's like, you're going to go away on business. That's what you're going to tell her, right? And she, he's like, fine, I'll do it. And he's very huffy about it. I don't remember the chronology, but yes, both okay. of those things happen. Yeah. I mean, at some point he does buy the box. He has to buy the box. Otherwise, the whole box, the, 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 the thing doesn't work. But yeah, that happens because... It, I thought that was part of the reveal. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able That's to tell bad. his wife that he's going to Scotland unless he decides to do it. Okay, I thought I thought that happened in the reveal. That's my bad. Oh, good. <clears throat> um, so he has that conversation with uh, a character whose name I can't recall. Uh, Is he a colonel? He's a corporal. Let's call him a Colonel Sanders. He's got the mustache for it. Sure. Okay. And um, he, but and a big scar on his cheek. Yeah, okay. They have the conversation, and then there's also a conversation between Colonel Sanders, Colonel Bernie Sanders, seven <laughs> herbs and spices, um, and then uh, there's another conversation between Major Rich and, and Colonel Sanders, where Major Rich is like, quit hanging out with, <clears throat> what's your face, and uh, uh, you got it, Mrs... Uh, whatever um, and they, because everyone's talking and you, you're making her look bad essentially and then we go to Poirot talking to the lady oh okay that's not what yeah. I meant at all that's I was going to say exactly what you did 
Absolutely. But I'm the one who forgets. Uh no, yes. So uh our colonel friend does tell Major Rich that he should cool it and Major Rich is like it's really, you know, there's nothing between us. We are friends. And so the older lady and Poirot then have their meeting and Poirot agrees to look into everything and she says come to this party because then you'll be able to see this cast of characters and more will be revealed right oh and we should mention that at this point uh miss lemon is out of town oh yes (laughs) so oh yes that is an element running through this episode where poirot and hastings are completely at sea because Hastings is trying to file stuff and Poirot oh, is God, he's bad very frustrated that Hastings can't make his tea correctly. Uh, Speaking <laughs> of They're completely Hastings. helpless without her. Yeah, they're absolutely... I like that, at sea. Uh, they're absolutely helpless, yes. Um, <laughs> Hastings, when he sees the lady, immediately... He's the one that asks, like, is that her husband? And you can immediately tell, it's like, is she married is the question. <laughs> <laughs> because up until that point, uh, the woman had not mentioned whether or not she was married. She's like, I'm worried for my friend. And he's like, that hot, that, that hot piece of butt. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he was Ugh. so horny. Back so at the opera, quickly. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. At the opera. So. Oh, he's like, just Quit. Just, you gotta chill, man. <laughs> the conversation between Mr. and Mrs. Clayton, where he... Tell, he tells her that he's going away. He mm-hmm. asks for Major Rich. And she's like, sure, if that's what you want. And that's how that bit plays in between. So it sets yes. up the uh, kind of triangle there. Mm. Oh, right. Um, yeah, because we had forgotten. Forgotten? Yeah, we had forgotten to mention that uh, he was going to leave a note for Major Rich, right? Yes. Is that what it yes, was? Yeah. Oh, right. There's that whole scene where he goes to visit Major Rich, and Major Rich is not home, and the butler answers, and yeah, and then Major Rich comes comes back and is like, "Well, there's no note. I don't understand." He's like, "Well, he must have gone out, sir. I must not have heard him." He's like, "Okay, fine. Just have people wandering about my home." <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Uh, there's a lot of conversations and so many mustaches. It's <laughs> they all look the same. <laughs> um, but yeah. So at any rate, uh, then we go to this party and Poirot and Hastings are mingling about, and we see Mrs. Clayton. Hastings is not there. And uh, Major Rich. Hmm. Hastings, Hastings is not Hastings there. Hastings isn't there. It's just Poirot because Hastings didn't get an invite. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's I, just Poirot, which is why Poirot is so uncomfortable the whole time. Because oh, he's right. by himself, and everyone's like, you should dance and have fun. And he's like, Mm-mm, I don't do that, <laughs> strictly speaking. Oh my gosh, I forgot Hastings wasn't there because I'm so used to seeing them together. Yeah. But, but uh, yes, Poirot at one point dances with the older woman. Oh, so uncomfortable, and he hates the Charleston. He's And there's a brief conversation where we finally get some very overt racism. Um, uh, oh yeah, because because he the Mister S- Colonel Sanders, um, he's like I hate this kind of music because they put on like some new jazz kind of stuff. Yeah, and he's like it's stupid music made by the inferior <laughs> race essentially. Oh yeah, and, and Poirot is like that's not a very kind thing to say. Right. <laughs> so yeah, immediately. Uh, getting out of Poirot's good graces or not yeah. entering into them at all. Um, mm-hmm. And we see Mrs. Clayton with Major Rich again at the party uh, and mentions she mentions that her husband is away on business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, everyone's milling about, having a pretty good mm-hmm. time. And then... Um... There's also an interaction with uh, Colonel Sanders and Mrs. Clayton where he's, like, touching her face, and they seem very close. Oh. Yeah. That's right. Like, they clearly know each other. Mm Mm-hmm. 
pretty well. Because they've been friends for a long time, but we right. later find out. Yeah. And then the party ends, and we get a shot of this cabinet that oh, it's so is good. dripping with blood. With what is clearly Kool-Aid. <laughs> With Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Woody, which is so the fakest blood I've ever seen, but it's so spooky, the shot. I loved it because it, like, crouches down low and, like, really gets into it. And it's just there's so much blood coming out of it. It's disgusting. And it was one of those things of, like, this is, like, almost a family show. And then there are moments like this where, like, if I was an eight-year-old, I'd be like, mm, that's terrifying. And it is sinking, uh, seeping into the white carpet. I think it's a yeah. white carpet, yeah. just for effect. Yeah. <laughs> you really get the full impact of it there. Uh, and then the next morning, I guess, Jap shows up at the office with Poirot and Hastings, who can't figure out what they're doing. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Jap says, well, all right, uh, Mr. Poirot, I've got to interview you as a witness. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, a witness to what, mon ami? <laughs> and he, Jap is clearly concerned but all about the murder, but also amused that he gets to come over and interview Poirot. <laughs> yeah, he's quite, yeah, he's quite smug. Uh, um, so, yeah, he makes it clear that a body has been discovered in this chest. And uh, Mr. Clayton's. It is Mr. Clayton. And Mr. Rich, uh, Major Rich, sorry, has been arrested. Yeah, because he's the most obvious suspect. And it and just it's seemed house. really odd to me, like, how, like, broken up Jap seemed to be over the fact, like, that the body, like, everyone was, like, partying around this body. Because, mm. yeah, gross. But, like, also, like, nobody knew except for the killer. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. He did. He did seem, like, real disgusted about it. Uh, and he makes that point very heavily to Poirot. And Poirot is kind of just like, oh, ooh. Yikes. Yeah, I find suck. everything disgusting. So, what is new? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy. Um, yeah. I like in your version, Poirot is clearly played by Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> ooh, uh, uh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, I've got Goldblum um, on the brain. <laughs> yeah. Um, and from there, they start their investigation. They go to jail, yeah. Do you want to take it, Tyler? Sure. Uh, Poirot is seen investigating Mr. Rich, uh, asking him his uh, account of events uh, that day and that evening. He starts at questioning him about uh, his wife and how long it's been since she's passed, uh, kind of alluding to that something improper is going on between Rich and uh, Mrs. Clayton. Uh, but he assures Poirot that they have only ever just been friends. Yeah. Um, and... He doesn't from... seem too flustered about that either. No, uh, because earlier uh, earlier on in the episode, we also have Colonel Sanders uh, going up to Major Rich and being like, Hey, people are talking about y'all. You need to calm it down. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think he's very much aware that, you know, there are rumors about town, so he's not surprised that, uh, yeah. that this is being brought up. The next person Poirot interviews is Colonel Sanders, yes? Right, he goes to the uh, fence fencing club. Yeah. <laughs> Which is In this uh, weird gym. Aesthetically beautiful. But then they meet this weird sort of, like, l attendant that leads them through and at one point he's like okay so the gymnasium is through there this is the like the golf course or whatever it's like you thinking about joining and both of them are like no <laughs> not the slightest i don't know where you got that idea and he goes all right and then he just moves through to the parlor room where uh colonel curtis right oh. because it reminded me of apocalypse now um thank you tyler thank you 
Um, the old yeah. CC. Uh, made a couple <laughs> CCs chaser? of mus- mustache stat. <laughs> Always. Always. Um, <laughs> and they interview him. And they find out that he's been a friend of Mrs. Clayton's for a very long time before she was married. Yeah. And the way he said it is, he says it is very, like, oh, yeah, we were friends. Like, very, uh, I wish we were more than friends is the subtext that I got Mm -hmm. out of that scene. Yeah, but he also casts his doubt uh, over Major Rich being the actual culprit of the murder. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because <laughs> I, I paused because I'm trying to remember, did he have a suspect? Uh, no, just, uh, I don't believe he did. He just didn't think Major Rich, for lack of a better term, didn't have, like, the countenance of a murderer mm. something like okay. that it was yeah yeah it's an interesting an interesting Cause he, uh because he also negates uh the rumors about uh clayton and rich Mm-hmm. right that's right yeah right so they ask if he was friends with mr clayton and he says, well, of course, because he was Miss, Mrs. Margot's uh, husband. Marguerite. Yeah. Uh, Major Rich calls her Margot later on. Oh. But, but yeah, so he was her husband. So, yes, we were friends. So it's all very connected through her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then where do we go next? Uh, Hastings, being Hastings, as they're leaving, is like, you see that scar? <laughs> mm. Yeah. And Pro's like, yeah. And he, like, moves on. And I think we then go to Mrs. Clayton at the jail. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. She goes to visit... uh Uh-huh. She goes to visit Major Rich. And she says, I mean, what are we doing? This is so... I feel so guilty. Blah, 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 blah. And it does make it sound like they were having an affair. And she basically says, I shouldn't have come here and leaves. Yeah. Yeah, more or less. (laughs) It's a little cryptic. That's why. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Hence the. Because they're in front of a guard, so they can't really speak freely. Only so much can be said. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, Poirot interviews her too, right? Yes. Yes. But I... Uh, we go to Major Rich's house. They're being shown um, shown uh, around by the butler. That's right. Uh, yeah. He wants to go see the chest. He sees that there's like a room divider thing in mm-hmm. front of it that obscured uh, its view for the party. And that's why nobody really knew or could see like blood pouring forth out of this box. Yes. Uh, he goes to investigate it. He um, sees a hole like in the yeah. chest in the front of it. Uh, he opens and the lid to examine it. Uh, he turns to Hastings and is like, what do you think this is? And Hastings like, woodworms? I know, he's so stupid. Like, God dang it, Hastings. I know. <laughs> Truly <laughs> just, it's in a perfect circle. Yeah. yeah, and there's sawdust, basically. Uh, yeah. That uh, Poirot gets on his finger. Woodworms, okay, Hastings. <laughs> I think I yelled at my TV about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, friend. Uh, uh, um, and the butler says he d- didn't hear... Um, he didn't hear... Clayton leave right and he didn't see Major Rich enter that afternoon before the party right which is important later right he was just very convinced that because he heard what he perceived to be a door closing that he did in fact leave right but he did not see him leave yeah and then we cut back to the Clayton's house is that right right Uh, yeah she goes in the bathroom and swallows a bunch of pills 
And I looked at it and I went, that's a lot of pills, but it's probably not going to kill her. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have no idea Pepto-Bismol. how many it takes. <laughs> oh, I, too much of anything is a bad idea. <laughs> Just Can you imagine idea. like ODing on that though? It'd be Pepto Abysmal. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, Bell, oh boy. Uh, yeah, so she does, she is unconscious after, after swallowing all these pills. And uh, the, the housekeeper, I guess, called Poirot, or they're already on their way over to see her at this point. Something, but Poirot and Hastings are at the door and the housekeeper sa- says to them, Something terrible has happened. You've got to come quick. And uh, they run upstairs and she's locked the door. So Hastings, not uh, you know, rams the door down. And uh, they get to her and uh, then you cut to a bit later and they talk about how she's resting. But she'll be okay. So then we have the interview with her. Oh, uh, she's like, oh my gosh, it's all my fault. I wished my husband was dead. So therefore, I spoke it out into the universe and it <laughs> happened. And I'm like, girl, uh, relax. <laughs> I mean, Right. She basically says that she is concerned that Major Rich misinterpreted that wish she had. Because... Yeah. They had always, Major Rich and Mrs. Clayton had always been friends, but once her, his husband, his wife, oops, uh, once his wife had died, uh, it started, they started to become interested in each other. It seems, it seems to me that nothing actually did happen between them, but she, she did express like, you know, if my husband were dead, we could be together or something like that. And she, she thinks that he took it as, oh, cool, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> Which it is, just... why does anybody, by the way, kill their husband or wife when you could get divorced? I know it's money, but... <laughs> <sighs> well, and that's part of it. And in the introduction to Mr. Clayton, they the, the older woman... Um, that we meet at the beginning of the episode is like he's not a pleasant person. Everyone yeah. was like, yeah. "Why did she marry him?" But he yeah. is very well off. But his behavior had been kind of stranger than usual um, before all this took place. But he's not a pleasant person to be around. Yeah, like why did she could have married whoever and she picked this guy? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. So that is what we learned from Mrs. Clayton. Mm-hmm. And then we get a scene with her being taken out or escorted out of the house. Is that not right? quite yet? Not, not yet. Okay. Um, we have uh, like Poirot and Hastings like having tea in a restaurant or something, and oh, sure. they're going over like the facts of the case and. Poirot is, like, talking about, like, how very difficult this all is, and he, like, it seems like this has, like, kind of got him caught up in a way that I haven't seen him caught up in a while. Um, and this is where he has his Eureka moment, yes? I think so. I believe, yeah, because he's talking everything out, and then, then he goes to Jap, right? Before that, we should do our ads. So let's take a break. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Hey, cool cats and kitties. It's your friend it's Tristan the Saucy Sleuth coming at you live from my disappointment. Um, <laughs> live on tape. Yep, live to tape. Uh, okay, so we got a Patreon. Um, Patreon.com slash ADCPod. That's uh, all of our social media as well. It's all, it's all the same. Pretty convenient. Now... <laughs> Um, for one dollar a month, which is not even the price of a cup of coffee, um, just a candy bar. Don't buy Where that candy at Rite Aid. Don't go out. 
Um, oh, but don't no. buy that candy bar at Rite Aid. And um, instead, give us a dollar uh, for bonus content, such as <laughs> our review of Murder, She Wrote. We're going through Murder, She Wrote, and we're doing reviewing episodes of that. It's been really, really fun doing a different um, thing. Uh, and also, do be aware that in the bonus content, uh, we don't bleep anything out, and it's kind of like a ooh after hours sort of vibe. We also did a really fun, very thorough and lengthy uh, review of the mystery of who ran over Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, which uh, harrowing tale. Well, for um, in defense of the length of that episode, sir, it's like over two years worth of stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I meant it as a compliment. It was oh, very okay. thorough. It's just like an hour and a half. So if you got an hour and a half and you're curious about Stone Cold Stevie Osti, uh, head on over to <laughs> Patreon and give us a buck. <laughs> and um, Cold Stone Stevie Osti. Uh, now, there's also for $3... You get early access to all the episodes. So the Monday before these are released, you get uh, this episode or whatever episode of Poirot we're doing. Um, so you got early access to that. You get bonus episodes as well. And there's a bunch of other tiers um, and stuff like that. So go check us out on patreon.com slash ABCpod. I took the Patreon instead of Tyler. Yeah, you, yep. sure, you sure did. You just... I got too horny for it. <laughs> you got so horny so for it. So what am I, I doing got... now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you want, what do you want to do then? I don't know. Uh... Okay, I'll just take it from... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we're all doing this together. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Well, I mean, whatever. Um... So we're on Melissa... the Scavengers Network, and that's a really great network to be a part of. They have podcasts like Historical Hotties, among others. Check out the Scavengers Network at your convenience. They can be found online if you search the Scavengers Network. <laughs> Scavengersnetwork.com. Scavengers and we, they've also got Spooky Spouses. They have Myth Takes. And just oodles and oodles of great pods. And you've got time. So why don't you download a couple of them? Also, they have a couple other pieces of content. They have, like, a fair amount of videos, and they've been doing live streams um, pretty much every day. So they got you plenty of stuff. You can be entertained if... by Scavengers Network for the entirety of your quarantine, basically. Yeah. Uh, so check them out. Check us out. We're on Twitter and Instagram at ADC Pod, And we're on Facebook or the amateur de- or amateur detective club. There's no that, right? Yeah, right. It the hyperlink is ADC Pod though. Oh, it is. Facebook.com slash ADC Pod. Everything slash ADC Pod at ADC Pod, and uh, then go on over to audible.com slash ADC Pod. Conveniently enough, and yeah, uh, yeah download that uh, free trial. There's so much things you can listen to. So much things. So many much things. things. And we're back. It was successful all around. No one commandeered other people's jobs. Fantastic. All, <laughs> all Perfect right. ad break. Good teamwork. Exemplary. Uh, none of us had a mild case of the <laughs> aneurysms. Ooh. Oh my. Tristan, I, the you way know you get muscle is spasms? absolutely bonkers right now. Yeah, I'm on another <laughs> plane of existence. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so Poirot has his eureka moment. And he goes to Jap, and he's like, I need to know the contents of Mr. Clayton's pockets. And he sends Hastings to speak to the um, uh, the associate at the, the gentleman's club, which now means something else in modern terms. I, I, but it is a gentleman's club. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, Poirot finds within the pockets of um, Mr. Clayton... 
um, a bunch of garbage, his wallet, a picture of his wife, and then uh, what appears to be a small whittling tool that would carve a hole in wood. Yes. Would it? Yeah. <laughs> Son of a bird. Um, you're really pining after that. Ooh. For sure. Leaves me quite popular with the ladies. <laughs> Please, no but sycamore of these puns. <laughs> but you didn't know you were going to get all the tree puns, all the wood puns mm-hmm. in this episode. But here we are. Happy. Yeah. Um, and then also Hastings talks to this guy and gives him 10 bob for to tell him a story about these two gentlemen um, who had the duel. And mm-hmm. it was over a joke um, at Mrs. Clayton's expense hasting yeah. deduces mm-hmm. and um they put two and two together um and then poirot is like i <laughs> there's this wonderful scene with jab where he's like he looks over at poirot and he's like you're gonna ask me to do something aren't you and he's like yes it's like i don't know why i even bother i should just just not quit my job, but I should just only call you. What are you going to have me do? What ridiculous thing are you going to ask me to do now, Poirot? Yeah, I think he's like, just I like straight up ask. A- yeah. Yeah. He's like, I need you to arrest Mrs. Clayton. And he's like, oh, ah, all right. And then we smash cut to a scene of the press outside the Clayton's abode and her being taken away. Right. And um, the press is like, Poirot, what, what are you, what, what's, what, what's going on? Uh, and he's like, I have nothing to say. And then um, he's in bed and he gets a phone call late at night. Oh my it's, gosh, it's so good. It's very funny because the voice on the other end, he's doing something with a cup and he's like, yes, I, I was born on the dock. Um, <laughs> he's like, I know who, who killed... Uh, Mr. Clayton come to this address at this time. Yes, and, and it's uh we got a, you know, silhouetted figure wearing a trench coat and a and a hat in uh a in a phone booth, one of those big red type. phone booths. <laughs> <laughs> a flasher? It. You're a fan of a flasher? I I'm a fan of a silhouetted figure in the dark. Mm. That's right. <laughs> Come no closer to me, sir. <laughs> Let my imagination gallop wildly. Exactly. <laughs> Thither and yon. <laughs> um, and and of course, back to the gym now. Exactly. Of course, the address is the gym. And it turns out, da, 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 it's Colonel Curtis. It's Colonel Tony Curtis. So Colonel Curtis comes in and... Who starts it? Does Poirot start it, or does Curtis start it? Curtis starts it. Okay. With the accusation of, like, you besmirched uh, yeah. the name of a, the, Mrs. Clayton. And he's like, well, obviously, you're in love with her. And he's like, da doy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Poirot spills, essentially tells him the, the uh, his whole reasoning behind it. He does, like, the parlor reveal to one person. Which seems, in retrospect, quite strange. Um, eh, it works. But it's a very yeah. murder she wrote kind of kind of uh, reveal. Yeah. Um, but essentially, he was in love with Mrs. Clayton, and every time someone would like besmirch her name in any way, he would come after them. <laughs> Um, yeah. Which is why he spoke to Major Rich, and he was the person in the duel, obviously, because that's how he got that big scar on his face. Yeah. Um, and because someone made a joke at her expense, and he got mm-hmm. really, really hype about it. Yes. Um, fun fact, I read this in the trivia in the IMDb, uh, David Suchet was legitimately a feared in this scene that uh, he was going to get stabbed. Oh, <laughs> so, no. Yeah, <laughs> so... The, um, the, the Colonel Curtis like threatens him with a an uh, a, a sword cane. He has a cane that turns into a sword. It's very cool. The best. Um, my uh, and, my stage combat teacher in college had a sword cane. Surprising no one in this conversation. No. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could have had that. You can mm-hmm. buy it. Yeah. 
I mean, I could, but I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Going around stabbing. Um, but yeah, Suchet is genuinely afraid, and you can kind of see it. Yeah. And and he's like, "What are you gonna do?" Colonel Curtis is like, "What are you gonna do?" You hope oh, he calls him a little f- frog. Oh yeah. And he's like, "No, first, Clayton, I am not a." annoying little frog i am annoying little belgian number one <laughs> number two you did it and we both know it um, right very because f- the whole f- deal was he set up clayton mm-hmm. he he said you know he's she's getting way too friendly with major rich and you should go you know lie to her tell you go- here you're going out of town and then spy on the two of them at this party yeah and you should do that by hiding in this chest and you know, putting in a putting a hole in the side of it that you can look through and hear through and breathe yeah. through also. Uh, yes. And now do it exactly question. this way. Mm-hmm. I have, you have a, a question. question. Go for it. Would either of you trust me if I was to say I need you to hide in a box? No. Tyler? You actually, yes. Oh. Well, I would no, get in the box for you. <laughs> I would trust you. I just wouldn't do it. No. <laughs> I don't get, no, here's my thing. I don't care. I love both of you. No. I would never get into a giant wooden box under any circumstance. I'm like, at best, this is a prank. Yeah. And at worst, you're going to set fire to this box or something. <laughs> Yeah, I have a weird fear of being buried alive, so... Oh, I don't think that's yeah. particularly weird. Well, it's just... The thing is, it's a strange fear because why would that ever occur? You know, it's not like not a... anything. Eh. But, you know, it's not a likely thing to happen in my life. So. Here's hoping. But, like, I could see it in the fact, like, if... We were, like, away on vacation for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Us and maybe a couple of other people. Sure. And then Tristan, like, comes in hurriedly and is like, everyone's out. He's like, Tyler, get in the box. I'm gonna be like, oh, <laughs> hell yeah, I'm getting in the box because something's about to go down and I need to be safe and secure somewhere. Okay, that's fair. In that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, get in the box. Hurry. <laughs> I'd be like, all There's right, no time, something's about to go down. There's no time to question it. I've seen enough horror movies to know that. <laughs> uh, so he makes the little hole to peep through, and then uh, Major Colonel Curtis rather stabs him in the eye through the eye. brain. Yep. He gives him a lobotomy with a sword. It's very gruesome. But. He also, of course, knew that Major Rich would be blamed for it. Of course. And then get him out of the way so that the path is now clear for Mrs. Clayton and her affections. That's yeah. the whole plan. That's the plan. And, and it always... didn't work. I mean, no. part of it did. but. <laughs> and rather than calling the police, Poirot oh has God. called Major Rich and they have a duel they have a fencing duel. I thought this was much more successful than the duel at the beginning. I thought they did a fine job. I mean, it's just a bunch of one-twos. Yeah, but, like, it's also not... But they did it okay. It's also not as though they were just swinging swords in the air and clanking them. That's fair. There was some movement uh, along the floor, but... There's yeah. a couple grabs, some grappling... <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's pretty good. Uh, so he's arrested, and Major Rich and Mrs. Clayton can be together now. And they tell Poirot, you know, we cannot thank you enough. You are the best. And Poirot says, "Oh, you flatter me." It was nothing. I it was, was lucky. nothing. I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> And Hastings, of course, remarks upon this, and uh, Poirot says, Oh, I was trying the modesty. I'm going to be the most... What does he say? The most he makes... humble. The 
humbility. He says uh, humbility. Right. Uh, yes, than humbility. Humbleness. It's very sweet. So great. Yeah. And that's the episode. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? What y'all think? I loved the heck out of this. This is totally my stuff. Uh, five out of five. Hmm. Yeah. That I love when people. I love it when people kill for jealousy and not money. Mm. I just get very bored when it's a totally financial situation. Um, not very bored. Some, sometimes it's very interesting, but like, I don't find it as compelling. I like the drama of a of a jealous lover. Um, I I like I like a weird murder. <laughs> um, and I like it because. Agatha does a lot of poisoning, and this was mixing it up a little bit. Um, I thought that all the acting was very good. I thought everyone was on their A game. Um, I loved the silly moments and the drama, and it is everything I look for in an episode of this show. Loved it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I was going to give it a one originally, <laughs> but... <laughs> Upon, like, recording this episode and what you said, Melissa, I'm bumping it up to a three. Oh. Two Um, points. For the reasons that you stated, uh, but I also had my fair share of issues with it. Okay. Um, The filming of it, I thought, was a bit confusing and a bit disjointed uh, at times. I thought that uh, the actual murder that we do see in the reveal of the sword going into the chest uh, it didn't make sense. Like it should have been like a much quicker stab than what we saw. Like, cause oh. like he could have clearly moved the heck out of the way. Like that was a big enough box to like at least duck your head down. Yeah. Um, and he sees the sword coming. Like, yeah. You have this great like, shot of like, him going, "What? What is that?" <laughs> it's like. Anything, I yeah. would yeah. <laughs> Like, you're not looking through a keyhole, dude. Like, there's no yeah. reason for something to be coming into the box right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nico, for every time I had to say that. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, and then just the name Major Rich to me was just too funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because there was this stable in World Championship Wrestling... Uh, called Misfits in Action. Nice. And it just seemed like he was just a character from that. Uh, right along <laughs> G.I. Bro and Major Guns and Hugh, uh, sorry, General Hugh G. Rection. Uh, so it just... No! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you love to see it, folks. I was you just love like, to see the art is... of sketch comedy thrive. <laughs> <laughs> um... So there's that, and, like, it also, like, I had to watch this episode three times because I was just getting, like, I just, like, was not focusing on it. It took, like, the third time for me to, like, actually, like, be able to, like, get into it. Get into the groove. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'd give it about a three and a half or four. I think three and a half. Um, I didn't have a hard time focusing on it. Um... But I also knew what was going to happen, and I, I halfway through remembered that it was a short story, but it also seemed very obvious who the murderer was from the get-go. Um, so there was that aspect, which is always, I take points away, of, like, if I can figure it out in the first, like, ten minutes, I... Yeah, and that whatever. doesn't bother me. I knew yeah, it, too. I know. Yeah, I like I like to stretch my brain a little bit, if I can. Um, but... Um, I, ooh, the supporting cast was not very strong, in my opinion. Um, the core cast was great. I miss Mrs. Lemon. The comedy bits were always solid, as they, they've really gotten into a groove of what's funny about these characters. I really liked Poirot in this, and I really liked Jap. I love that moment where <laughs> there, he's also at a typewriter, and he's like, I don't know how to type. I'm a detective, not a secretary. <laughs> yes. Damn it, Jim. I'm a detective, not a secretary. Yeah, um, that's good. Uh, and it's very funny. And I, I loved the core cast in this. Um, however, the supporting, it, it was fine. Um, 
I did like how the murder was different. I thought it was really messed up. I thought it was very disgusting and very brutal. Um, and I understand your point, Tyler, of like, it should have just been an in and out. I did like how it was sort of realistic of like, he has to like force <laughs> the sword through this man's skull. It's disgusting. It's absolutely horrific. Um, I thought the way this was shot was really cool, and there was a re couple of really great edits, actually. So, because of that, I'm going to give it a four. It was like a piece of t television. It was very strong. Story-wise, yeah. All right. That's Sorry, there I was one more thing that I forgot to mention, um, mm -hmm. which also why I gave it a low rating initially, is because I can excuse racism. <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> Yes. But this to me was just like the it really made me mad at Poirot in this episode, which I think is what kind of threw me. Hmm. Is that like he does not come to defend anyone else when racist accusations are heard around. He in fact uh, takes part in that as well from time hmm. to time. But as soon as someone you know calls him French and like we have like that scene I at the party. And then we also have the uh, xenophobia hurled at him in the end scene, uh, because Frog, I believe, was like kind of a derogatory term for French people at that time. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, okay. So it's just like, okay, all of a sudden we're going to act like all heroic and like, oh, xenophobia is wrong now. Okay. Sure. All right. I now uh, adjourn this meeting of the Amateur Detective Club. Gavel sound. Uh...